The Ponzi scheme is one of the biggest scams worldwide. But did you know it was orchestrated by a college dropout who was also a migrant? Today at Finance Spur, we'll learn about the scheming life of Charles Ponzi. But if you like this video or anything about finance, technology, or business, consider subscribing to our channel and like this video for more amazing content. So to understand how Charles Ponzi created the greatest scheme of all time, we must first know how it works. A Ponzi scheme is a deceptive investment scam that lures individuals with the promise of high returns on their investments. The scheme operates by using funds from new investors to pay returns to earlier investors, creating the illusion of a profitable and legitimate enterprise. However, in reality, the returns paid to earlier investors are not generated by any legitimate business activity or investment success. Instead, they are sourced from the capital contributed by newer investors. This unsustainable structure relies on a continuous source of new investors to keep the scheme afloat and to pay the promised returns. As the number of new investors decreases, the scheme eventually collapses leaving most participants with huge financial losses while enriching the scheme's orchestrator. So how did Charles Ponzi created this scheme? Born in Lugo, Emilia-Romagna in Italy on March 3, 1882, Charles Ponzi hailed from a well-to-do lineage in Parma, his family holding the title of Donna for his mother. However, financial misfortune had them fallen from prominence he then started his career as a postal worker. But Ponzi's aspirations led him to the University of Rome La Sapienza. Although he was lured into a rich lifestyle by wealthier friends who perceived the university as an extended vacation by going to bars, cafes, and attending the opera. Wasting money in this vice, he emerged from four years without a degree and was financially destroyed. This era was also the time when young Italians migrated to the United States to amass riches before returning home, a phenomenon that urged Ponzi's family to force him to go to the United States to restore their former rich lifestyle. He then arrived in Boston aboard the SS Vancouver in November 15, 1903, and a mere $2.50 in his pocket, or about $81 in 2022 because his entire life savings had been misspent through gambling during the voyage. He later stated to New York Times, I landed in this country with $2.50 in cash and $1 million in hopes, and those hopes never left me. In a determined bid to carve a path for himself, Ponzi swiftly adopted himself to learn English and undertook a series of odd jobs spanning the eastern seaboard. He eventually secured employment as a dishwasher at a restaurant, enduring austere conditions by sleeping on the floor. He then progressed to the role of a waiter, but bad luck soon followed, as his promising trajectory was disrupted by allegations of theft and cheating customers, resulting in his dismissal from the position. In 1907, Ponzi moved to Montreal and worked as an assistant teller at Banco Zarossi where he observed the concept of using new deposits to pay interest, which later became known as a Ponzi scheme. The bank's owner, Zorossi, offered high interest rates that grew rapidly, but it was later revealed that the bank's finances were in disorder, leading to its failure. But Ponzi stayed in Montreal and aided Zorossi's family and attempted to start anew in the U.S. However, Financial difficulties led him to forge a check, and he was imprisoned for three years. After his release in 1911, he became involved in illegal immigration and was imprisoned again. In prison, he associated with mobsters and learned from fellow inmates, including fraudster Charles W. Morse. Before committing more crimes, Charles Ponzi also worked at a mining camp in Boston. This is also where he met his wife, Rose Maria Neko, a stenographer. In the summer of 1919, Ponzi established an office in Boston and identified a financial opportunity within the international reply coupon system. 
These coupons allowed for profitable exchanges due to variations in postage costs between countries. And Ponzi claimed he could yield over 400% net profit by exploiting these differences. He left his job, formed a stock company to raise funds, and convinced friends and investors to contribute with the promise of doubling their investments in a short period. Initially 90 days, later reduced to 45 days with a 50% interest rate. He capitalized on the promise of high returns, even paying some initial investors as promised, while employing the arbitrage strategy involving IRCs and low-performing European currencies. He later launched in January of the following year the Securities Exchange Company to promote his scheme, initially drawing in 18 investors with $1,800. He promptly paid them from funds acquired from newer investors the following month. As word spread, investments surged, leading Ponzi to establish a larger office in the Niles building on School Street. He also hired agents, paying them generous commissions, and between February and March 1920, total investments escalated from $5,000 to $25,000. With huge success, Ponzi extended his operations into New England and New Jersey, attracting more investors with impressive returns. By May 1920, he had accumulated $420,000, which grew to $2.5 million by June and reached nearly a million dollars per day by July. Ponzi aimed to control the Hanover Trust Bank through substantial deposits eventually acquiring a controlling interest with friends after placing $3 million. Despite the influx of funds, Ponzi's scheme operated at a significant loss, sustained only by new investments paying existing investors. His investor base encompassed a wide range, from working-class immigrants to Boston's elite, including police officers and even his relatives. Ponzi's scheme was growing. And though he continued paying investors from new investments, he hadn't found a way to convert IRCs to cash. He realized the impracticality of doing so due to the huge volume needed for the arbitrage. Despite this, interest payments flowed back to him as investors reinvested. Ponzi enjoyed a lavish lifestyle, bought a mansion, owned luxury cars, and even tried to donate a substantial sum to charity. He then faced suspicion, but a libel lawsuit and his charm neutralized the initial investigation into his schemes. However, signs of trouble emerged as investigations increased. The Boston Post's investigation prompted panic withdrawals from Ponzi's scheme, and while he managed to pacify investors, deeper investigations revealed the scheme's failure and the inability to deliver as promised. His audacious scheme collapsed, leading to his arrest on charges of mail fraud and larceny. Charles Ponzi was then imprisoned with 86 counts of mail fraud and faced life imprisonment. He then pleaded guilty and was given five years in federal prison. Judge Clarence Hale, who was the judge in his case, stated that here was a man with all the duties of seeking large money. He concocted a scheme which, on his counsel's admission, did defraud men and women. It will not do to have the world understand that such a scheme as that can be carried out without receiving substantial punishment. He then spent the rest of his life in poverty and worked occasionally as a translator. He died in 1941 of complications due to a heart attack. But regardless of his later life, he was an icon in the world of crime. His scheme was later known as the Ponzi scheme and was used worldwide up to this day. But did you know there are also modern scammers such as Sam Bankman Freed that created one of the biggest scams in the 21st century? If you are interested in videos like this or videos about finance, technology, or business, check out our channel and subscribe to show your support. For now, this is Finance Burr. Have a great day.